And Michael, um, so the best, so the founder and principal, a big idea guru, right? Is that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and on the web at michaelhudson.com. Okay, cool. Yes, perfect. All right, Michael Hudson, you're the founder and principal of Big Idea Guru, and you are on the web at michaelhudson.com. Thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor and a privilege, Josh. Thank you. So, Michael, you're a coach, you're a speaker, consultant, you're a podcaster. Uh, for someone who's listening to our podcast right now, you can search in your favorite podcast directory, Get Your Message Heard is the name of your show. What, what do you talk about on the podcast? And, and I should be clear, Josh, right at this moment, the podcast is on a brief hiatus while I'm re rejiggering things a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. Podcast started, there's, you know, there's 104 episodes there. The, the first 50 to 70 episodes were really about how to get your expert business started, how to get the message you have unlocked to turn it into a business, and, and how to get yourself off the random revenue roller coaster. The interview phase really shifted more towards let's look at what people have done, how they've gotten here. And yeah. one of my desires is really to unlock that, you know, that really underlying story that people don't always talk about. So it's a lot of those kind of interviews and conversations. Yeah. And Michael, what is the impact then that you have in the world? So I, I know that one thing that you're, you're really, really big on is, is, is helping people. And it feels like, you know, kind of be integrity with the impact that they really want to make and the audience that they want to serve. Is that right? Or can you kind of further define that for me? Josh, I think that's a great characterization of it. You know, the thing that I kept discovering, and I've been doing this for 35 years, right? And when you're working with speakers, coaches, consultants, and, you know, leaders of entrepreneurial businesses that are sort of at that scale up stage, you know, kind of hit the 5 million mark and now they want to go further. A lot of times they're struggling with what do they say to get the right clients and having the guts to say, I'm going to say what I believe and repel the wrong ones. Hmm. And so, you know, the fundamental change that that makes in their business is they grow faster. They have less stress. They have more time because they're not serving the wrong clients. And they get much more aligned with their purpose and their vision of what they wanted to create as opposed to what sometimes they've ended up creating accidentally. Now, you take people, do you, you take people through a process in order to discover that. And what does that process look like? I mean, what, what are you exactly, what are you asking? Or what, what are some questions that maybe we could even ask ourselves to begin, uh, you know, kind of begin that journey to say, hey, wait a minute, something, it's, I thought, you know, it's like, uh, you know, the entrepreneur or the business professional, it's like, man, something just feels a little bit off. Like, how can we be introspective enough to discover that and and how can we begin that that shift to kind of right the ship to get more in alignment with what we really want to do that's a lot of the questions i put in there <laughs> I, i'll give you a 12 second answer <laughs> yeah josh i think it's it starts by asking yourself this question and i'm going to refer people and encourage them to read michael bungay stanier's book do more great work and what michael describes in the book is there's good work bad work and great work you know, bad work is abbreviated wombat because it's a waste of money, bandwidth, and time. Good work is the work you're good at. If you don't do it, it doesn't get done. But great work is the work you're really on this planet to do. So the first, my first step in making my pivot and really sort of owning what I'm doing now was making a list of all my clients and putting in one of those three columns. Is this bad work for me? Is this good work or is this great work? And when I did it, Josh, and made a pie chart of it, I was at 65% bad work. 5% good work and the rest in the middle. I said, this isn't acceptable. So I made the gutsy choice and fired 65% of my clients the following Monday morning, made a commitment to double the business. And, and you know, the, the question in my mind was, how do you do that? It's like, well, what have you learned on your journey? You know, all the things you've learned on your journey that you're not sharing are often the things that open the door to the right clients raising their hands. And so in my, you know, so when you look at the simplicity, my framework is, you know, you, you draw a timeline, you know, and identify what's happened. Then you look at what are the pivotal moments in that journey you've traveled and what outcomes did those moments produce? Now you put those two, those three things together and that reveals the lessons that only you can deliver. And as I shared with you, I believe you're here to deliver to a certain audience who needs to get them from you and who will be brought into your world somewhere along the lines. Those lessons then allow you to create the framework that you can then use to replicate what you have done through other people and help them leverage your lessons. Does that make sense? Give me a couple, yeah, give me a couple of before and after examples uh, that, that would indicate you might want to 
take what I'm talking about pretty seriously. Let me demonstrate why. Let me tell you a story about so and so. And, and Josh, I'm gonna uh, let me tell you my story real quickly. Just, right? When I did that good work, bad work, great work exercise, you know, my business was in let's just call it level X, um, in the in the under quarter million range, and that's where I wanted it. Right? My business is a lifestyle business for me. And when I fired those clients, got clear on the messaging, started sharing it. Guess what happened within 45 to 90 days? Yeah, I doubled the business, and all of a sudden they started showing up like magic. And you can imagine the conversation when you come home and tell your wife, I'm firing 65% of the clients on Monday to go after right. the ones I really want to work with is not an easy conversation. And that trust factor, they'll show up, but they do. They just start to show up. So, you know, you take another person, you know, I've worked with where their business was in a situation where they were riding the random revenue roller coaster. They would get lots of clients to fulfill their targets and their, their targets were, you know, low six figure range. And, which, is, which tends to be the sweet spot, right? A lot of people I work with, they're making a transition and just getting started from something they did before. Like maybe they were an FBI agent. One of my current coaching clients is a former FBI agent, for example. And this person was tired of the fact that when you, they felt like they never had any money. They were working their tail off. You know, they were frustrated mm. by some of the work. You know, so we mapped the timeline of their revenue during the year. Guess what happened? There were cycles. And you know the cycles. We all know the cycles. There were the times when you were so busy serving clients, you weren't attracting new ones, and then you didn't have any clients to serve, and then you were a, had no money. So in this particular case, getting clear on what the real message was focused them. And I, you know, I think we undervalue the power of focus, the power of not spending our time doing things that aren't productive, not infusing activity with accomplishment, but always doing the right stuff. So we reduced the amount of hours the person was working because now they got clear Instead of having 10 conversations to convert one client, you know, now they're having 10 conversations converting six or seven clients because they're not talking to the ones that don't fit. Um, and getting them clear on, you know, the, the path of here's what you're here to say. This is what you know, letting them throw out. Because, you know, a lot of people, particularly in that transition phase, are just looking for the revenue. So they'll go take anything, like the wheels. Yeah. <laughs> I think I, I see a lot of that with early agencies or uh, freelancers uh, who say, I technically know how to do that. So I want money. Okay, I'll do that. <laughs> and I yes. think that that lasts for a while. And then you're like, oh, what am I doing? And um, Michael, my, my, my question is, how often does this seem to follow a pattern of going from gen being a generalist to becoming more specific. So one thing that I've seen us do quite a bit is yes, technically my team and I, there are some things that we could do. We just don't do that anymore. Um, we we're happy to refer that business out. Um, but you know, it's, it's so satisfying when I think when we stay in our zone of genius, you know, uh, like for example, like media placements, like we can get our clients five to 10 media placements every single month and we do it in a very specific way. There are tens of thousands of PR agencies that can get media doing more of a kind of a proactive push kind of, uh, you know, where they're just pitching their clients. I don't like that model and we don't do it. And you know, you go work with them. That's not what we do. Um, so I've noticed I've very much in my conversations, like when people ask, uh, you know, can I do a certain thing, you know, saying no, I like we could, but we don't do that. <laughs> well, I don't philosophically, I don't believe in, in that model. I can send you to other people. They'd be happy to take your money. Um, I just, you know, I'm looking at my crystal ball and I'm like, I believe what I believe. Um, yeah. is, is that kind of, am I kind of getting warm with your philosophy? Yeah, you just nailed it. I mean, that's the thing. It's getting to what do you believe and what do you own and what is more important? You know, in my case, right. you know, my personal journey, and this is a heavy thing to drop on your audience without ever having met me or knowing me, but you know, I'm, I'm over it. It's fine. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure the sympathy. But I was raped and molested when I was 10 for a year. Now, as someone who verbally processes the world and understands the world through talking through ideas and solving problems, that silenced me because the person threatened to kill me if I ever told anyone. Well, that locked me yeah. down. For, and frankly, Josh, it locked me down far longer than I realized in other ways, in part because I didn't want to tell the story. 
the most powerful, impactful thing in my life, I didn't want to share. Mm. So then one day I, I, I go to an event. It was actually Michael Hyatt's platform conference, and I hear a Ken Davis speak. And I sit there and I go, you know, all you've ever done is communication work, and you don't call it that. You call it other things. Why do you do that? And I realized, because you don't want to tell that story. Mm -hmm. I said, you know what? I'm going to tell that story. Six months later, I'm at a client event doing an all-staff meeting, and I make, I'm, I'm teaching them about story, and I mentioned the same statement I just made here on the podcast. The meeting, we take a break, it's lunchtime, you know, 10 or 12 people come talk to me, one stands over in the corner. She's got her arms crossed, and I know her because I've worked with the company for a few years. And you can tell she's bothered. When the last person walks away, she comes over, puts her arms around me, Josh, hugs the stuffing out of me, and starts crying on my shoulder. And I don't mean crying, I mean bawling. Four or five minutes later, she kind of calms down. I said, what's going on? She said, I had no idea you were ever afraid to speak in public. And she said, the thing is, that's my story. This mm. thing happened to me. And she said, you know how I don't speak up in meetings, but I always talk to you privately. I said, yeah, I noticed. She mm -hmm. said, that's why. Because I don't think my ideas have value. I don't think I have anything to share. Now, the beauty of this story is six months later, seven months later, I go back and I'm working with the leadership team again, which this person's on. They're talking. She's speaking up the end of the day, she stands there and she comes over to me. She says, I need to say thank you. I said, well, um, I appreciate that. For what? She says, well, because you had the guts to tell that story last November. I took a six month leave of absence, went and dealt with what happened to me. So I now know what it means. And now I'm finally realizing I have value. And that was the day, Josh, I said, you know what? I've got to help people do this because we can't do yeah. it. You know, I was just at um, I was just at Social Media Marketing World, and I, I saw a presentation, and it really uh, was helpful for me. Uh, I, for a long time, I was afraid to tell people that uh, I've been through bankruptcy. I've lost two homes. You know, when I started Savings Angel, I couldn't pay my heating bill, uh, and I wouldn't tell that story because I felt like, well, then people won't trust me as much because they'll see that I'm flawed. Uh, and, and I need to project this attractive character. And one thing that I learned is that, you know, people will, that they will check you out based on your experience, your wisdom, your authority, uh, but they'll stick around and engage with you for your authenticity, your imperfections. Uh, and they'll say, wow, this person is just like me. And so I think, you know, a good litmus test I've seen is if you have a good follower account, but nobody's engaging with you, I don't, there might be a relatability issue. Uh, and, right. and I would invite, you know, someone that's experiencing that to kind of take a look at, are you just broadcasting your perfection or, you know, maybe see what happens when you start getting real with people. But I suspect people are going to really start connecting with you. Um, yeah. You know, we're in a social media world and um, you know, for, for our entrepreneurial friends, I think that's pretty critical. I think it completely changes the conversation, right? Because now mm -hmm. if I'm that person, so let's say I see Josh and I'm impressed by him. I see the work he's doing, but I'm afraid to talk to him because he seems too good. Mm -hmm. you know, when I see it, uh, I don't want to say chink in the armor, but that's an easy way to describe it. I realize, yeah. wait, a minute, maybe he's more like me, you know, and maybe there is something there. And, and I think you open a door to a different conversation. And, you know, I'm not trying to push the make your pain your path button because sometimes it's your gain that is your path. Sure. And, you know, it, and the problem is we tend to not want to share the gain because we feel like it's braggadocious. You know, for example, in my world, for a long time after I left the academic world, I didn't ever say the reality that I built two programs at major universities that both were nationally recognized in the top 20. You know, and I didn't want to say that because I felt like it was braggadocious. Well, you know what's interesting? When I started sharing it, different people raised their hands and it turns out they were the right people. Whereas those who didn't know that didn't have the context because it was, a, I was able to do it kind of because of the gift I have of seeing what's possible where others don't see it. Yeah. So the, the point is that that story, that lesson that you learned, and I, I, I use the phrase you earned from your journey, is the door opener to attract the clients you're here to serve, to repel the ones you're not. And the sooner we get yeah. comfortable saying, you know what, you're not for me, and that's a good thing. And then you said something in our pre-conversation that ties right into it. 
but I, let me tell you who I would refer you to that I think you should talk to. Because when we're in this space, we tend to know the other people who are good for the people we're not good for. Yeah. Um, so, Michael, you've got a free three-part video series, and it's called Attract Your Clients. So, the person yeah. who's listening to us, you can go to michaelhudson.com slash attract. So, a series talks about pain, the problem, the path, and how to attract your clients, and of course, uh, the ones that would fit, and repel the ones that don't fit. Um, and so, I appreciate you for putting that together and, and, and offering that. Uh, and so, Michael, you are the... Um, founder of Big Idea Guru uh, since 1984. Uh, and of course, you're on the web at michaelhudson.com. Thank you so much for joining us. It was a pleasure and a privilege, Josh. Thank you very much and love the work you're doing. And um, thank you for having this kind of podcast. I love the framework and the format and the content you could share.